So uh, tonight's speaker is uh, from North Carolina is Ernie Dowler, and Ernie is uh, currently the director of the City of Raleigh Museum. Uh, his background is he had a um, he got his bachelor's in history from the University of North Carolina Greensboro, and his MA in history, public history from North Carolina State. He's also a veteran. He was in the uh, uh, Ar the uh, Army Reserves and the North Carolina National Guard. And the book tonight that uh, Ernie's going to be talking about, when with his assistant Josh Sokal doing the videography, is they're doing something that we don't. A lot of times we don't really get into. This is really great that you guys are coming from North Carolina because a lot of times this doesn't get covered that much. Yeah. You know, it's kind of like Lee and Grant and that, okay, it's over and there's, there's no more conversation. <laughs> so uh, this is uh, really interesting. That they're also working on filming a documentary, correct, on PTSD hmm. and the Civil War. Well, so the focus of oh, the book and the talk tonight is uh, Ernie's book, It's Hearts Torn Asunder, Trauma in the Civil War's Final Campaign in North Carolina. The warm Chicago, so we're out there. Well, thank you all so very much. Uh, we, we've been here uh, and, and the, the hospitality has been exceptional and it warms this Southerner's heart. <laughs> hospitality is at a premium. So again, thank you so much for having me this evening. And uh, truth be told that I chose this week specifically to come and talk to you guys um, about this topic because what is tomorrow? Veterans Day. And my talk specifically deals with uh, so much about veterans. And if you stay with me tonight and can go down this heart of darkness, I hope that you will come away with a new understanding of those Civil War veterans who survived the war, the men and women who were civilians caught in the middle, and hopefully have an insight into the veterans in your own family's lives. Because again, this topic transcends times as I try to make the case. And I've given this talk all across the United States and I kind of have to put a trigger warning on this talk sometimes that whenever I have veterans in the rooms and I pitch into this, this talk begins to, to pick at those padlocks of those memories that have been locked up for so long. And so I've had veterans walk out on me. I've had veterans come up in tears. So it is profound. And it, it, it reinforced to me that I'm kind of on to something with this book when I can elicit that veteran's experience. So it's kind of a weird, like something I like to put out before I talk. So. I start this talk by asking a very, very simple question. Um, hold on. Does anybody know where this is? One. Who? Close. close. Oh, it's close caption. I saw. Close. Close. That's house. So in my junior year of college, I was bitten like many of us were by the Civil War bug. And when I first graduated, I got a job here. This is where uh, General William Tecumseh Sherman accepted the surrender of General Joseph E. Johnston. It is the largest surrender of the American Civil War that we've never heard about. Over 89,000 Confederate soldiers were signed away within the walls here. So my first job out of college was working here, and I was so excited to tell everybody in the entire world about Johnston, Sherman, the Civil War, and everything. But the number one question I got inadvertently every day was, where are the bathrooms? <laughs> and what it taught me was that uh, people did not know what happened at the Bennett Place, the farm of James and Nancy Bennett. And, and I really started to, to churn up something in me that, why? Why do we not know what happened here? The largest surrender. And the American Civil War is the most written about chapter in American history. So why has Bennett Place been forced to the very back dark shadows of our historiography? That's kind of where I started. Now, as I begin to explore this question, 
this monument came into play. Now, this monument is perhaps one of the most unique you're going to see dealing with the Civil War anywhere in the United States. One column represents the North, one column represents the South. The materials are collected from across the United States, and across the pediment, across the top, is labeled with a simple, profound word, unity. Unity. When have you ever seen a coming together after the Civil War in a marker, a monument, like the Unity Monument here at Bennett Place. But when I decided to, to research the Unity Monument, something fascinating decided to come out of the historical record. I discovered that, that whenever Durham really became the post-Civil War tobacco capital of the world, you might argue, that these new business leaders said, hey, we need to mark the spot where Durham was born. If it was not for these Confederate and Union soldiers breaking into storehouses and getting their hands on that sweet smoking bright leaf tobacco, we would not have grown into the post reconstruction tobacco capital we are today. So, whenever these business leaders decided to put this monument here, they met fierce resistance. The United Daughters of the Confederacy said, oh, no, 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 no. We are not going to mark one of the sites of what they called the surrender of Lee's army. Those old Confederate veterans said, not on my watch. And a lot of people in Durham were fairly apathetic, if not hostile, to putting this monument up. Now, what is also telling is that no Union soldiers or no Union group decided to chip in behind this effort. So in essence, nobody wanted this. And I found that very fascinating. But after a while, the monument was unveiled. This is it, 1923. We just celebrated the 100th anniversary of the unveiling of the Unity Monument unit last month, we, the 100th anniversary of the Unity Monument. And, and what I sort of came to the conclusion is that perhaps the erection of this monument picked away at some of the scabs from the wounds that the last days of the war caused. And that sort of led me to look at what's going on in North Carolina after Appomattox. These last days that we really don't care about, truly, what's going on? What is the story? Could it be so painful that people really wanted to forget about this surrender, the largest of the war, the spot where at one point the surrender negotiations reunited the nation in one fell swoop of a pen? I don't know. So that's where you begin. Now, my favorite part of this uh, picture is that there were those Confederate veterans that came out, but you can see they're all asleep. <laughs> that's my favorite part. They're all asleep on the, the background. And on the center stage is this African-American man, which I'm very curious to see who he was and why is he sort of taking this sort of semi-place of honor in this photograph. So let me set the stage for you because I am on foreign turf so you guys may not know what Piedmont, North Carolina looks like. And so this is it. Raleigh is where I work and run the city of Raleigh Museum. Chapel Hill, UNC. I purposely left off Durham because that's where Duke is and we don't root for Duke. <laughs> Greensboro, where I graduated from college. And so this is the arc of the North Carolina Railroad founded in 1856. So this kind of gives you a, a, a real, a, the, the stage in which our characters are going to be acting on tonight. Now, how these armies arrived in North Carolina. Sherman marches from Atlanta to the sea. He is called to Virginia to help Grant pry Robert E. Lee out of the entrenchments in Petersburg. So he basically comes through the Carolinas, fights the Battle of Bentonville in March of 1865, and pulls his forces into Goldsboro. The reconstituted Army of Tennessee and their General Joseph Johnston is just outside of Goldsboro in the small town of Smithfield. Now, on April 2nd, Grant breaks Lee out of Petersburg and trenches and begin moving west in the Appomattox campaign. So there's no longer a need for Sherman to go to Virginia. Now, Sherman re-points his army in this great arc, not to go to Virginia, but to, to do the last thing that's going to bring peace to the Union, and that is the destruction of the Army of Tennessee. So on April 10th, April 10th, a day after Appomattox Courthouse, this campaign begins. 
Sherman begins moving after Johnston, and Johnston begins moving west, who is unaware of what the calamity that's happened at Appomattox Courthouse. The goal had been for the armies to unite somewhere in Piedmont, North Carolina, and either turn on Sherman or Grant, but Johnston is just wandering blind across the Piedmont until he learns of this disaster at Appomattox. And they move across the Piedmont, the breadbasket of the Tar Heel State. Now, what we're gonna see is a perfect storm arise because where do all of these paroled veterans go? The paroled veterans from Appomattox, these men who had fought from everywhere from Sharpsburg to Gettysburg, so the wilderness campaign, these men who had ended their trauma of the worst battles of civil war, they began drifting south and they collide with the Johnston's army moving west. Now who really suffers in this equation are those civilians caught in the middle. And it's only because we sue for peace that these armies freeze in place for several weeks and this incredible ungangly drama of the end of the Civil War plays out here in North Carolina. And it's a really ugly end to the war. Unlike Appomattox, it is not a handshake between these two gallant noble warriors. It is a protracted week after week, dissolution of the Army of Tennessee, rampaging in the demoralized state while Sherman's men are happy about victory and crushed by Lincoln's assassination. It is an emotional roller coaster in the highest form of the term. So that's really what makes this campaign so interesting because it is so yieldy and so confusing and so chaotic. And that's where I think the emotions of these men are pushed to their, their limits. Now, I want to introduce you to Cornelia Phillips Spencer. And she lived in Chapel Hill, and she had seen the war unfold beneath her doorstep. She had been there in 1861 when all of the students of the University of North Carolina marched off to a very short and glorious war. She was there to see the last vestiges of the Army of Tennessee march through on their retreat towards surrender. She was there when the Union Cavalry occupied Chapel Hill and stayed there during these last weeks. And she had heard so much about what the war wrought on her neighbors and friends, and she had seen it all. So in 1866, she decided to write a book, a true, true history of the end of the war. One that she said that would indict the victors, right? That's not really true. And so this is what we have here, her book, perhaps one of the very earliest histories of the end of the war in North Carolina, the last 90 days of the war published in 1866. Now, as she's making this case of all these horrible things the Union Army does, she runs into a problem. And her problem is she has to tell about all the horrible things the Confederates did in these last days. So she struggles with this and she, she writes this caveat in the book. And I want you to read you what she says because it's gonna be a common theme that is repeated throughout both North and South and for the next, I would say 150 years. She says, what our soldiers did not do in those last dark days of confusion and utter demoralization, we record with sad and tender allowance. Wrong was done in many instances, and their excesses committed. But we feel that the remembrance of their high and noble qualities will in the end survive all those temporary blots and blurs. And for those who perished in the wrongdoing engendered by desperation and failure and want, their cause has perished with them, so perish the memory of their faults. So she's given the Confederates a pass. So all of these horrific things that these demoralized Confederates are doing these last days because they failed. The Confederacy failed. The Southern society turned upside down, so we should forgive them. And one of the very interesting stories I start my book with was a story that she included, and I'm sure she really struggled with to record. And she may have tempered with the truth a little bit, I believe. And it starts with the fall of the capital city of North Carolina. On April 13th, as Sherman's army of 89,000 Union soldiers are at the very gates of Raleigh, one of the last Confederate capitals to still remain in Southern hands. Two governors of North Carolina, Governor David Swain and William A. Graham, 
rush out. They, they take a train into the skirmishing armies to beg Sherman for quarter. Spare the capital city. Spare the university in Chapel Hill. Sherman says, fine, I will do that. The Confederate army is retreating west. They uncover Raleigh and keep moving west to an unknown fate. So the morning of April 13th, these two governors prepare to race back into Raleigh and have an easy turnover of power. But before they enter town, they are approached by Sherman's cavalry commander, General Judson Kilpatrick, one of my favorite, if not the most colorful general in the entire Civil War. And that's a whole other talk I would love to tell you about him. He approaches these two governors and says, all right, Sherman has given you a free pass. We will spare the city. But if I meet any resistance, there will be hell to pay. The two governors said, all right, no problem. They race back into the deserted city. A light rain is sprinkling on it. Explosions echo from those un, uh, the ordinance the Confederates set fire to as they had evacuated the city. And Swain rushes to the state capitol and he looks down Fayetteville Street, one of the main streets, key in hand to the Capitol and prepares to hand it over to the Union Cavalry. Now into his vision rides a problem. A gaggle of Confederate cavalrymen ride in and Swain calls them the debris of our army. And he watches these men tie up their horses immediately across from the state Capitol and they begin looting a jewelry store. So Swain says, this is not good. This is going to jeopardize the entire state capital, a capital that we had worked so hard to pull up to make it a modern state of the union. This cannot stand. So he marches across the street and confronts these men and a shouting match ensues. And one of the Confederate troopers turns to Swain and says, damn Sherman and damn the town too. We care for neither. And at that moment, they look down Fayetteville Street and they hear the strains of that Union hymn, Hail Columbia. And they see Kilpatrick, who is turning the capture of the Southern Capitol into a parade. Flags unfurled, best uniforms. So the gaggle of Confederate soldiers jump on their horses and dash out of town. Except for one. One lone Confederate mounts his horse, sits in the middle of the street, and waits and waits for Kilpatrick to get closer. When he's about 150 yards, directly in the front of my museum, this young trooper pulls out his pistol and begins firing it, yelling, hurrah for the Southern Confederacy, puts his pistol back in his holster and dashes out of town. But sadly for this trooper, the road he took didn't go out of town. He hits a dead end. He whips his horse around, the horse slides on those wet cobblestones and he falls. Before he can mount up, he's captured by Kilpatrick's staff officers. Brought back to the Capitol grounds. Now, at this point, I'm going to tell you two versions of his story. <laughs> One of them is her version. Now, Cornelia Phillips Spencer in her book says, this young trooper was brought before a very angry Kilpatrick. Kilpatrick says to this trooper, why did you violate the truth? The young trooper says, well, I didn't know of any truce. Kilpatrick says, well, too bad. Turns to his staff officer and said, take this man out where none of the ladies can see him and hang him. She tells us next that the young trooper begged for five minutes to write his wife, cruelly denied, and he was strung up where our current governor's mansion is today. The only problem with that is that there was an eyewitness that saw the whole thing. Millie Henry. And this is the state capitol. Millie Henry was an enslaved woman born in Yazoo City, Mississippi. And when the war came, her master pulled her back to Raleigh. And she was there that morning drawing water from the well on the Capitol grounds and saw the whole thing. She saw the trooper shoot. She saw his escape. She saw his capture. And she saw him pulled back before Kilpatrick. Now, 70 years after the incident, when the Works Progress Administration are interviewing the enslaved people, that incident, what she saw was burned into memory, and she told those interviewers what she saw that morning. And in her account was the only documented evidence that names this young trooper. And in her version, Kilpatrick asked this man, what is your name? 
He said, I am Robert Walsh of the 11th Texas Cavalry. Kilpatrick says, why did you violate the truce? And in her version, the young trooper says, because I hate the Yankees and wish they were dead in a pile. Take this man out, run on the ladies and see him and hang him. And amazingly, in her version, this young trooper begins to laugh. Begins to start laughing maniacally at his death sentence. He tells Kilpatrick, kind of you, sir, kind of you. And laughed all the way till they strung him up. Those two do not jive, these two accounts. Is Cornelia Phillips Spencer so perishing the memory of their faults? I don't know. But it, it begs an interesting question about how Southerners saw the crimes of the Confederacy in the war and how others saw it. So where is the truth? And we have to sort of pull back and do a little bit of research. Now, the 11th Texas Cavalry was a sister unit of the 8th Texas Cavalry, these guys here. And I make the case that if you want to see the most demoralized Confederate soldiers in the Army of Tennessee by 1865, look no further than this. If you want to know why the Wild West was wild after the war, Exhibit A. Now, this young trooper saying that he wished the Yankees were dead in a pile was the worst thing you could have said to Kilpatrick. Because Kilpatrick had been finding his men dead in a pile, largely due to these men. Kilpatrick in the official records talks about finding his men mutilated, executed, throat slit, placards hung around the corpses that said death to foragers. Now, by the time these men arrive in central North Carolina, they were, southern civilians feared them almost as much as the Union Army. They were that horrible and so demoralized. And the other exhibit I put into this is this fellow right here, John W. Rabb. Now, Rabb was a member of the 8th Texas. And in 1863, he had, he had uh, received a wound, which his fellow soldiers said had robbed him of his reason. Very important, robbed him of his reason. Now, the other thing I need to tell you about Rabb is he had a pistol with 60 notches in the handle. One for each man he killed. And these are the type of people that are running around causing chaos in these last days of the war. Now, to follow Rab through the rest of his life, what we need to do with all these other soldiers, on the 20th anniversary of the start of this campaign, April 10th, 1885, John W. Rab took that pistol with those 60 notches and killed himself in San Antonio. And this is going to be a common theme throughout the lives of these veterans to say, hey, to understand this experience, we need to follow them through the rest of their lives. But let us not cast all guilt at our Southern brethren because our Northern brethren too had selective memory on this campaign. Now, if we look at Sherman's march across the South, I like to say it is the most successful psychological warfare campaign of the entire Civil War. What Sherman wanted to do by plunging into the very heart of the South was to not only undercut Southerners' ability to make war, but their will to make war. It's, an, it's a pretty interesting idea of what Sherman wanted to do. And he has a very incredibly powerful quotes. Years after the war, when Sherman was pressed on this topic, he said, human nature is human nature. You take the best lot of young men, all church members, if you please, and put them into an army, let them invade an enemy country, live, up, live upon it for any length of time, and they will gradually lose all principle. It always has been and always will be so. So this is the tool that Sherman used to take to the South. He needed something that would really make Southerners feel how horrible it was to make them pay for starting this war. So across Georgia, it, it, it laid waste to so many plantations and homesteads. But if you really want to see the very darkest chapter of the war, follow Sherman into the Carolinas. Sherman's men were 
so angry at South Carolina for starting this Holocaust. They wanted to extract a great revenge on South Carolina. And yeah, Union diaries are so full of it. And the most profound statement I ever found from Union soldiers entering South Carolina, one guy said, our army did not feel bound by the ordinary restraints of human warfare. That's pretty heady stuff. That's pretty powerful. Now, I want to draw your attention to this fellow, Samson J. North, and he was there and saw it all. And when he arrives in Goldsboro, he sets down with pen and paper in hand and writes his wife, in which he admits to her that he is thoroughly disgusted at everything he had seen the army do. And this is a quote from his letter. About being disgusted, he said, the reasons I will give you when I see you. I do not wish to write them that they are a disgrace to the American nation and her armies. And I would to God that they shall never be chronicled in the annals of the 19th century, but if chronicled only by American historians, they will pander to public opinion and sufficiently enough to gild them up and make them appear in a less repulsive form. Ooh, how Victorian is that? <laughs> so what he's saying is that even if you said what we did, you couldn't do it because it is so horrible that we need to put a veneer on it that people would try to have some understanding of what we did. And there's an often quip that comes up in many soldiers' letters. And I want you to look for this. If you do read about Sherman's campaign, a lot of soldiers say, you know, the half will never be written. So what we see is this campaign to the Carolinas is pretty hardcore. It is not the gallantry of the battle of Gettysburg, of Shiloh. It is the war on civilians that really makes this post-war life a little uncomfortable. But how did men come to wage such awful war on each other? How were they robbed of their reason? How did they do such horrible things? And this is where we're going to get into tonight to try to understand the minds of veterans by 1865. Now, before I became a history major, I was an art major. So we're going to see some fabulous Civil War artworks. And you can't go wrong with Winslow Homer, am I right? Winslow Homer, playing old soldier. Now, anybody who's been in the military knows what playing old soldier means. That all of a sudden, when it comes for duty, you're like, oh, my back road ailments suddenly pop out of nowhere to get you out of doing duty <laughs> and i think this is the quip that homer is trying to point to here but after writing this book i went back to this painting and i was like hold on a second maybe homer has it wrong maybe something's going on here that as a as a observer he's saying one thing but something else really is going wrong and I'm going to point to these two chaps to make that point, Dr. Jacob DeCosta and Isaac Stern, because these were two federal army doctors. DeCosta spent his time in Washington hospitals. Stearns was a regimental surgeon, I think, of the 22nd Massachusetts. And these two doctors began seeing patients that were exhibiting symptoms that they couldn't understand. So were they playing old soldier or was there something going on here? Now, Stearns and DaCosta, the patients they saw were, were exhibiting really weird cardiovascular problems, that they were patients at rest, their hearts were beating, uh, they were constantly complaining of being dizzy, they couldn't focus, um, they were just having a lot of problems that they could not diagnose. So DaCosta really focused in on this cardiovascular problem. In 1864, he begins writing about these patients that he has no idea what's going on. And after the war, he continues to write, and he kind of coins the term irritable heart, that these soldiers are having this heart condition that is either, either due to uh, stress from the equipment they're wearing. Is it stress from the diet? Is it uh, stress from the battlefield? We don't know, but something's going on with these men we cannot explain. Now, Stearns takes another approach because he's seeing the same problems in the same patients, and he does not know what's going on but he looks over the ocean for his inspiration for answers. 
and he focuses on a British doctor named ben Dennis Devert Hovell. And Hovell is looking at British soldiers with the same conditions who are veterans of the Crimean War of the 1850s. And so he's starting to look at the correlation between what's going on with them and the soldiers that are wandering into his hospital. And he begins to, to coin a term for this condition, which is perhaps if we had to label a period label for what we would now consider a post-traumatic stress disorder, it comes from the pen of Isaac Stearns. He calls it post, post-bellum neurokinesis. Now, if you can remember that, you'll be a hit at the next dinner party. Post-bellum neurokinesis. And they really started to begin to look at the nervous systems of battle on soldiers. Now, the interesting thing is that Hovell also starts to talk about the idea of moral shock. Moral shock. That these guys are, are going from civilians to soldiers and something's happening to them, that their morals are suffering. So it kind of leads us to believe that there is a morality issue having to be wrapped up in their combat service, which kind of hears us about how, how good people can do bad things on the battlefield. Now, trying to understand what's going on with soldiers is timeless. I can point to you to examples of ancient Syrians in 1800 BC who have nightmares about talking to those they've slain on the battlefield. All through history, we see little glimpses of this. And even in our own time, pick a term for your war that we sort of classify what's going on with soldiers and the problems they're having. Shell shock, World War I. Battle of Fatigue in World War II in Korea. PTSD was not a thing in Vietnam. It is coined in 1980 after the war is over. So call it what you will. It is a condition of the human experience at war. And I'm about to explain, or try to, that in scientific terms. Now, when historians start wandering around in the medical field, it's thin ice. But we have to conquer this to understand. And hopefully, as you guys go back and read letters and diaries and history books, take what we learned tonight and look at it and see if this applies to those soldiers you read about. Now, how this works, if you as a person interpret a situation that you are in fear, is it a mugger? Is it a tornado? Is it a car wreck? Is it combat? Your brain does an incredible gymnastics. Now, the frontal lobe of your brain is where reason takes place, language, all the skills of higher thinking, and especially morality, judgment. Judgment is the front of your brain. Now, when you encounter fear, your body says, "Uh uh-oh, we have to prepare for it. This incredibly powerful neurochemical cocktail takes your brain, shifts all of the energy from the front to the middle of your brain, the primal brain, the brain that does everything you don't think that you think about doing. It tells your lungs to breathe, tells your heart to beat, tells your digestion to take place. That comes from the very center of the brain. So when you have this fight or flight or freeze or fawn reaction, all of your energy goes to the center of your brain. Your brain is telling your body, get ready, we're about to do something. We're going to run, we're going to fight. Something's going to deal with this threat. So your heart speeds up. Your muscles tense. Your vision focuses. You get ready to deal with this threat. And that's how we as a species have survived for a long time. But what we see is continued flipping of this day after day repeatedly, like in combat, like 10 months in combat, many months in combat, over land campaign combat. Your brain gets stuck. It gets stuck in this hyperactive mode looking for the threat. And this is where problems begin. Now, no longer can soldiers play old soldier because now we have the technology to literally see the damage that this this flip does. It's fascinating. And fortunately, due to a lot of research and those new veterans from Iraq and Afghanistan, on the far left is what a healthy brain looks like. But when you're stuck in post-traumatic stress disorder, you can see how it changes, physically changes. 
traumatic brain injury is a new term that's coming to our lexicon from uh, those soldiers running over improvised explosive devices, football players with traumatic brain injury, and then the poor souls who have both. So yeah, we've got the ability to really see how trauma changes the brain. It's fascinating. Now we can't apply this to Civil War soldiers who are long gone, but what we can do is take the symptoms that we see in modern veterans and go, hey, can we look back at those diaries and letters and find instances of this? And this is what I did for my book. Once I began to look at this and go back to those diaries and letters we love so much, I started finding. I started finding examples of all of these things that men and women were exhibiting in these last days. Now, usually with PTSD, we talk about the flashbacks, something about the trauma of this memory keeps coming back and re-exerting this fear response in the brain. People try to avoid those places. Is it a, a song, a smell? Is it a monument that elicits those emotions? And what I found most interesting, this emotional numbing, because I'm sure all of you have read about those hardened veterans. That term is used a lot in Civil War, hardened veterans. And these are men who are emotionally numbed, right? And for those people who are stuck, always looking for the next threat, that fight or flight, always trying to figure out where the threat's coming, how can you concentrate? How can you sleep? How can you, you're, you're angry because you can't sleep and you can't be angry. So these are instances that we see a lot pop up in the historical record. Now, as I looked at the trauma that's going on in North Carolina, there are no large battles. There's Bentonville, Aversboro, but there are no bloodbaths. There are no Gettysburgs and there's Sharpsburgs and there's Chickamauga. But what I had to keep in mind, that all of these men coming from all four corners of the United States in these armies brought that trauma with them. Every battlefield, these men had those experiences. And Adolf Metzger was one, the 32nd Indiana who made this horrific sketch that burned into his memory. This is from the Battle of Shiloh. And the 32nd Indiana was there in North Carolina. So these men experienced this type of trauma. And it's a horrific picture of these two Confederates being playing cards when the cannonball comes by and takes their heads off. This is what on full display in those last days of the war, as these emotions run high. So what I want to do is kind of talk about a couple of these instances, these very personal stories of these men that were there. Newell Gleason is a great one. Perhaps one of the most valuable men to help save the Union Army at the Battle of Chickamauga, whose 87th Indiana stood firm on Snodgrass Hill to defend, to buy time for the escape of the Union Army. And they suffered greatly for that heroic stand, about 49% casualty rate. Now, his efforts won him great uh, applause from his commanders, but it took a great toll on his mental health. As Gleason is traveling with Sherman's army to Atlanta, junior officers noticed that something was wrong with Gleason. He would pull them aside and Gleason would confess, ah, I know of the threat to remove me from command. And they would see him by the campfire laughing one minute and weeping the next. And as the army pulled into South Carolina, the usual disciplinarian raised up in his saddle and announced in a great loud voice to his men not to leave a living thing alive in South Carolina. So yeah, he suffered. And to make the suffering stop in 1886, he threw himself down a flight of stairs. He ended that suffering. Now we talked about the execution of Union forages by Confederates. Well. This led Union authorities to have a tit-for-tat execution. So the Union Army began executing Confederate prisoners. And John A. Cundiff had the awful, awful responsibility to be on one of these firing squads for an aging Confederate who drew the short straw. Now, when Cundiff went home after the war, those ghosts followed him. And he always afraid that Confederate agents were out to get him. His family remembered that he would take his musket and blanket and go sleep in the woods rather than sleeping in the house. 
and never really got over it. And his obituary noticed that that he had the paper said that he had hoped that he had found peace in death. Now I'd like to point out this is perhaps one of the most civil, famous Civil War dogs. And you guys know there's an entire subgenre of literature on Civil War dogs. It's really weird. And Harvey is one of the most famous. And he is the dog of Daniel M. Stearns. And Stearns had a little bit of a humor because he made Harvey a collar that said, I am D.M. Stearns' dog. Whose dog are you? <laughs> and Harvey and Daniel were inseparable. Now, Stearns' problems happen outside of Atlanta. He came down with what doctors diagnosed as sunstroke. So whenever you see sunstroke in some of these pension records, it is doctors just throwing a, a dart at trying to diagnose, which is something some more psychological than just literally what we think of sunstroke. He's out of action for 48 hours. He's put back in the saddle, thrown into the awful combat at Utoy Creek. Now, Stearns and the 104th Ohio didn't travel with Sherman across Georgia to the Carolinas. They went north to try to stop Hood's invasion of Tennessee. And they were there at the Carter Cotton Gin and caught the full fury of Patrick Claiborne's attack there. But they made it back to Carolina through a circuitous route, and they were there at the end. So Stern saw the very end of the war. Now, when he goes home, it doesn't take very long for his family to realize that the Daniel Stearns they sent off to war was not the man they got back. He, he decided, he, they noticed that he didn't want to hang around with any friends or family or other veterans. He just wanted to be with Harvey. Harvey, who was there, and Harvey became his support animal. He would tell friends that whenever he would walk, he, feel, he felt like the ground was, was undulating in front of him. And he always complained that he felt like there was an iron band wrapped around his head, squeezing it. And after a while, his family couldn't put up with him. So they put him into the North Cleveland Os Asylum. And he was there up to months before he died in 1889. Just another soldier who suffered. Suffering also in, on the Confederate side. And for this, I go back to another Homer painting, which I think is a fascinating painting for Homer to put to canvas. Defiance, inviting a shot before Petersburg, 1864. And Homer could have never have seen this scene, but he painted it nonetheless about a young Confederate climbing up on top of the earthworks where Union sharpshooters were would easily have slain him and waving his fist, his clenched fist at the enemy hoping to put you put out of his memory misery in those trenches at Petersburg. Another painting, George Lambden. This is a fascinating story. George Lambden, son of one of the most preeminent portrait painters in America, went to war to paint his brother, his brother James, who enlisted in August of 1862. A quiet moment aside of a soldier trying to make sense of the combat he'd seen. James lasted all the way up right after Sharpsburg and resigns his commission. And he's so frail in body that he dies just five years after the war. Lambden stops painting people and starts painting roses and flowers, perhaps traumatized by his own experience of watching his brother waste away from his experience at war. Now, two Confederates I wanted to throw out in the mix, Thomas Klingman and William Holland Thomas, both North Carolina boys. Klingman, before the war, had known as North Carolina's prince of politicians, serving time in the House of Representatives and the Senate, resigned when the North Carolina left the Union, fought in all the major combat, the Peninsula Campaign, all the way to the Weldon Railroad. And in the last days, I think he loses a little bit because he wanders into Johnston's headquarters, hobbling from his wound, and approaches the general and begs, begs Johnston to allow him to lead a last-ditch suicidal attack on Sherman's army, a Confederate Thermopylae named after that great Greek battle. And hilariously, Johnston says that he wasn't in the Thermopylae business and declines it. Now, Clayman is allowed that he, he keeps the war at arm's length for quite a while. He has a very successful post-war career. But 
as many veterans. The war finally found him, and he spends his last days in a North Carolina asylum. Thomas, fascinating story, raises a regiment of uh, Cherokee Indians in the mountains of North Carolina to fight for the South. They are known to have scalped Union soldiers they captured. They fought that really ugly neighbor against neighbor, brother against brother, mountain warfare. They did see some service in the Shenandoah Valley campaign in 1864. But unlike Klingman, Thomas could not keep that war at arm's length for long. In 1867, Thomas's wife puts out a call to friends and family that said, come and get him. After he held an ax over her head and made her play their family's piano. So he is in and out of asylums for the rest of his life. He's lucid sometimes, lucid not. It's just a tragic story. Now, this is an incredibly weird story to really highlight just how, how defeat really preyed on the minds of Confederates. Now, this story is written by a guy named William F. Allison, who's actually walking away from the surrender. And I feel after reading this, that this story really weighed on Allison's consciousness because this appeared in the very first Confederate veteran magazine in 1893. So he's unburdening his heart with the story. And it's an incredibly weird story that he's walking down from the surrender. He begins to see these big patches of blood in the road. And he sees the scene up ahead about this guy sitting on these railroad ties and, and talking to this group of people. And the guy's got this, this uh, red and white paisley shirt. And as he gets closer, he hears the guy say, there is no use for me. Please take my jacket and give it to my wife. She is the daughter of General Reigns. And he notices a lot of weird things starting to go on at once. That his shirt is not paisley, red and white paisley. It's white, but it's bloodstained. And this guy is sticking his hand in his shirt and pulling out this bloody hand from what he thinks is a self-inflicted wound and starts wiping it all over the shirt. Incredibly strange strange, but it just highlights what's going on in the minds of these Confederates as they walk away from defeat. James E. Taylor, another great war correspondent that traveled with Sherman, gives us this 1888 drawing from Battles and Leaders of the Civil War about what Southern civilians could expect from the arrival of Sherman's foraging army. And it looks fanciful. But if you read a lot of stories about Southern civilians and even Union soldiers, this is not quite far off. And again, everybody's favorite part of this is guy tackling the pig at the bottom of the knife. <laughs> That's over the top, but it happened. So how, as you, being in the path of these armies, how would you react? Hearing the stories and watching the people flee, reading the newspapers, getting letters from family, it began to take a real mental toll. The anxiety that these stories about what you could accept, what the fate you would suffer in the advance of Sherman's army. Now, nothing looms larger in Southern nightmares than this, the burning of Columbia. It's a fascinating story. And I truly think that the Union Army didn't want to burn Columbia. But there were a lot of factors. The trauma of these soldiers were on display. And when you're met entering the city on an empty stomach and you're given pitchers of alcohol, those demons from the battlefields from across the South are let loose. And this is the effect. But this reverberated through every Southern community, and especially in Raleigh, which was the capital of North Carolina, to see the fate of South Carolina's capital. Now, one woman who really felt this was this lady, Margaret Devereaux. And this was her plantation house in Raleigh. It's called Will's Forest. Now, in April of 1865, the upstairs of the house is full of traumatized refugees who have been fleeing the advancing Union armies. Now, when the alarm goes off that Union soldiers of Sherman are arriving in her plantation, she jumps up. She has to go warn the rest of the family. So she begins running through the house and she looks out the windows as she runs down the hall and sees her yard filling up. 
She dashes upstairs. She grabs Mrs. Craig. They run over to the window and they look out. And all of these dirty soldier faces are looking up at her. And there's actually a soldier climbing up the side of the house. Now, everything they've heard about these horrible Yankees and what you could expect at the hands of these villainous men. Mrs. Mrs. Craig turns to Margaret Devereux and says, well, rather than face the ravaging that they expected or, and feared that would happen to them, she said, well, we can always throw ourselves from the window. So prefer suicide than what their imaginations thought were going to happen. And that reveals a lot to the minds of what Southern women were going through. Now, conversely, a neighbor of Cornelia Phillips Spencer, Lucy Battle, and this is her house, which still stands today in Chapel Hill, Senlac. And I, I know it's hard to believe, uh, looking at Lucy Battle, that she was a woman that kept a firm grasp on her house. She does look like a first firm disciplinarian, doesn't she? <laughs> her husband writes a letter to their son in Raleigh. As Sherman's army approaches Raleigh, her husband William writes, and I want you to kind of anticipate what I'm going to ask you after I read this. William writes, your mother, speaking about Lucy, thinks that she is afraid that she will soon be unable to procure the medicine that she is in the habit of taking, and that the consequence will be that she will be unable to sleep and get back into the measured condition in which she was some years ago. If she does, I fear it would almost kill your mother. What is that medicine? Exactly. That's, that's my bet. And we see this, and we have to remember that the first American opioid crisis comes into after the American Civil War. That this is the way, that especially Southerners, heal the wounds of the war. Now, Lucy lost both of her sons fighting the Army of Northern Virginia. And the wave of grief that swept over North and South hurt so many hearts. So they turned to opioids. And, and all sorts of other drugs to sort of feel that alcoholism is rampant. Now, in North Carolina, we can see the effect of mental health on the asylum records, which have just opened up. Now, the city of Raleigh just purchased the old asylum grounds, and we're going to turn it into a happy, skippy new park. <laughs> and this is built in 1856. Now, what's interesting is the very first patient who enters the hospital is a veteran a veteran of the Mexican War, who is suffering from what? Sunstroke. Fascinating to see how that goes around. And we can look at the hospital records and we can see the wartime people putting in there due to the war. But in years following the war, it mushrooms. And here's what those records look like. And they are incredible. As a historian, I mined these as much as I could in the book to tell the story. Now, what we see here are the names of the people who are uh, admitted, the dates. This is late 1864, January of 65, ages, sexes, numbers of attacks, the supposed causes, how long they've been going on, and how it manifests in their lives. And it's all here. You can see the war. So if you go down the list, fright, fear we talked about earlier, epilepsy. Epilepsy is an incredibly diagnosis that I just found yesterday. The Milwaukee Historical Society of all those soldiers who were coming from the soldiers' home to that asylum, suffering so much from epilepsy. I'm not sure why. Loss of father, ill health, excessive use of, excessive use of narcotics, and perhaps the most telling, what doctors simply caused the problems plaguing these people, the war. The war. So we can see the war damage people. Now, the one I really wanted to pull out is the very last entry on that page. So this entry is for April 18th. Now, keep in mind that the Union Army occupies Raleigh on April 13th. So this is the first patient who is put into the hospital after the Union occupation of the city. And you can see this person is a 45-year-old male suffering from the war for the past month. 
and it is incredibly telling who it is. Can you guys read that? It says Isaac African. What we're seeing is the first African American put into the asylum by union authorities for help with his mental problems. Oliver Otis Howard personally did this. They interact with the white. So this is the integration of the state's hospital at the hands of the Union Army. Fascinating. And that's one thing we don't think about are those black Southerners who are in this great mix of the war. So what we see is this transition from freedom, from slavery to freedom, it's not easy. Because in the minds of Southerners, these people are going from seen as a liability, a, a, a commodity to a liability. So we see those demoralized Confederate soldiers killing slaves, beating them. It's a very dangerous time. But after that, we see their mental health improve while white folks decreases. It's a crazy inverse. We have to ask, what is the legacy of the trauma of slavery that shows up in these, these folks? And this is one that appears at the hospital. It's fascinating to think about. This is Eli Hill, who was, had been a slave in Onslow County, North Carolina, enlisted in the 37th USCT in August of 1864. He, he is one of the very few uh, soldiers, black soldiers, who travels with Sherman into Raleigh, who was there to see the surrender. Now, Hill stays with the Army until 1868 but he's back in Raleigh in 1871 as a patient in the hospital. He dies in the hospital and is still buried there on the grounds, feet away from other Confederate veterans who are put into the hospital. But he is put into the hospital for a term that does not apply to a lot of white patients. He's put in there for self-pollution. Not quite sure, not sure what that means. Now, again, as we try to Lastly, unlock the, the war experience that is, it echoes through the lives of these folks. We need to look through the newspapers. And Victorians, this war was ever present in the debilitated bodies of the veterans they saw every day, but it plays out in the newspapers. And so you can see that the, the GAR plays an incredible role as they look around and see their brethren suffering from the mental effects of war and try to take care of these men. Even the United States government begins funding soldiers' homes, asylums, national asylums. Or again, we see incredibly horrible uh, articles that could even mirror what we see in today's newspapers of veterans killing others and killing themselves. Uh, it is a truly tragic story that plays out in the newspapers. So to understand the wartime of these men, we have to follow them through the rest of their lives. And I'm going to end it on a Homer, which is the most profoundly moving painting, I think, which kind of wraps up that veteran in the new field, a solemn veteran who has returned to his pre-war role to try to pick up where he left off. And I know you can't see it. There's a canteen and the sack coat laid aside. And if you look closely at the, the scythe that he's using, Homer has painted out the cradle scythe, and it is now a single scythe, which has so much meaning. Is it reminiscent of the Grim Reaper scythe? Is it they're all the veterans who are gone? It's very telling that just the ghost image of that scythe can be seen. So for survivors of the Civil War and their families, that romanticizing the war, changing the memory of the war, was a bit of the salve to heal those wounds. Because if we, if, we, if we don't talk about what's going on at the end of the war, how awful it was, the campaign through the Carolinas to talk about the war was, maybe, maybe we can agree on an ending that was noble and gallant. And maybe Appomattox takes that role of Grant and Lee, these two great leaders, Lee surrounded, forced to surrender, shaking hands, and we can move on from the war. Because Johnston and Sherman's surrender was ugly, it was long, and had very little honor to celebrate. So I think that is how trauma, the painful of this campaign, was left aside, put in the shadows for a surrender and an end that was noble and that could 
the nation could rally around to reunify, leaving the surrender at Bennett Place still in the dark and the stories of these men and women for us to find years later. Thank you all. Thanks, thanks, Ernie, for a great talk. Sure, Get sure. a second for a couple of questions. Yeah. Uh, anybody have any questions to kick, kick us off here? Hi. Yes, ma'am. You talked a lot about the the, the everyday man. So, but what about people like um, Sherman, who, you know, the general? Did they go back and were they as impacted as some of the everyday soldiers? Uh, let me think. Generals? I'm thinking of Sherman, who, you know, had such devastation. And he had his mental breakdown early on in ran, the war. Yeah, and Grant Grant appeared in Raleigh. Uh, I can't really think of a lot of generals who were impacted. Carl Schurz really, after the war, went around and tried to figure out what happened. He interviews Sherman and gets some very damning quotes from Sherman about his march. So he really tried to figure out this experience. So I don't think a lot of uh, generals, we see a lot of general officers and a lot of men have some breakdowns over the years, but not anybody that high. For me, I had a question. You, we were talking just before the uh, earlier in the evening. You talked about the actual writing of this book and how you actually came up with this. Read with tell, uh, tell yeah, us yeah. how that uh, that came about. Uh, so I wrote this book twenty years ago uh, when I worked at Bennett Place, collecting all of these uh, these ideas. And I wrote the book as a general military history. And then I looked at Mark Bradley's book, This Astounding Close, which is a great book. He has a great trilogy of books about the end of North Carolina. And I said, I can't write that well. <laughs> so at the same time, I was actually working on a screenplay, a movie screenplay. And I really wanted to say, you know, every veteran's movie is like a crazy veteran. It's like, is that true? Can I write a veteran into a movie that's not this stereotypical veteran character? So I really started to look at the experience of veterans from Iraq and Afghanistan. And I started looking into this PTSD and it struck like a lightning bolt, as I saw the symptoms of PTSD, and I said, hey, I, I saw a guy talking about this, or I saw a woman mentioning this, and I went back to the historical record, and it was all there. I had just not known what to look for. So I burned down this book and had to rewrite it around this theme. And so trying to bring anything new and fresh to the Civil War is kind of impossible. So, but there's a whole body of uh, work that is really starting to explore PTSD. And so I thought, you know, how can I use these last days as an example to really push that and explore it? And so that's how it came today. So, Thanks. Any other questions? Sure. Oh, yes. Hi, thank you very much for your talk. I brought very much. Mm -hmm. uh, I've heard from some historians who propose that it was Sherman and Grant in their battle, uh, particularly around the Vicksburg area, they realized that this total war that you talk about in Atlanta, you know, in, in Georgia, as well as in the Carolinas, that it was actually more imported from the West to the East because of the fierce resistance that they experienced in uh, Mississippi and Tennessee. What, what's your opinion about that? Yeah, so it's interesting how, how terms change. So total war has changed a little bit. So uh, there's a great book by uh, Mark Grimsley. So he said, you know, total war is not total. Total will be the death of civilians. It's a total pestilence of the land. So he, I kind of agree with him, it's called hard war. And you're right. That comes from the West. And Sherman gets really frustrated with trying to battle all these guerrillas and said, hey, if they're going to fight fair, I'm not going to fight fair either. So these soldiers, the 15th Corps, 17th Corps, learn their craft out West. And when it's let loose on Georgia, these men have perfected that that hard war campaign. So you're exactly right. They they learn how to do it out in the 63 out of Mississippi. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, seems to me that from what I have read, uh, and I have known, by the way. People who fought in World War II, Vietnam, who suffered, and we did the international family. I also have read and known veterans who fought, who did not come home 
field PTSD. He came home. I mean, he had, if you read, for example, I think the book is called Wolf Davis, the man. Mm -hmm. And I forget the guy's name, but he, he had this disturbing recollection of meeting uh, a little black guy in the home in a way. And, uh, and he wanted to be a Texas state representative or something. Uh, anyway, I, are there any figures on how many soldiers fall in one camp versus the other? Uh, yeah, doesn't. the number one question, I think Josh was drilling me on this earlier. And again, I think we talk about be, people being affected by war. It's a spectrum. You know, you can talk about people absolutely not affected. Some people are affected, but can deal with their emotion. And some people are crippled by it. So the only thing I can think of is trying to draw our numbers from World War II and Vietnam. Like it's a kind of a rough, down and dirty ballpark. So I would say 20, 20 percent, 25 percent are people who have the soldiers who had developed problems that I would consider debilitating, that really struggled and suffered at some point in their lives that that caused them wh where the war got on top of them, for lack of a better term. So that's just a, a shot in the dark. Any other questions? Yeah. Probably the but uh, cold mouth, how does that reflect in your thinking or in your research uh, about uh, how civilians uh, anticipated the coming of both in the end the veterans? Yeah, inter interesting question. So, yeah. Uh, so, the cold mountain as we talk about is is a, that mountain warfare in appalachia is truly neighbor against neighbor and that's some ugly warfare when you're fighting friends and neighbors and even family that's that's a little different because what we see with sherman's army is is almost like a, a juggernaut and the the psychological power of sherman he even before he arrived people are suffering from newspapers and letters and diaries and Sherman's the image of the bummers grows large in the imagination. So that that fear even precedes the arrival of the army and deeply affects people who are even nowhere. It's funny to have people claim that they were afraid of Sherman's bummers and Sherman was like a hundred miles away. And it just shows you how much this perception of Sherman and what his army would do grew in the southern psyche so that's why i say it's a psychological successful psychological warfare campaign so it's a little bit of apples and oranges on cold mountain that that re appalachian region versus sherman in the central part of north carolina so more, perhaps here people in carolina also had a, their own certainly in the mountains yeah that's like you know that unionism because north carolina had an incredible amount of unionism and and we that's why sherman's men tended to take it a little easier in North Carolina, unlike South Carolina, because they knew that North Carolina had such a larger unionist population. They're like, yeah, maybe these people, we can save them or convert them somehow. But uh, that that's not always true because it's hard to put that toothpaste back in the tube coming out of South Carolina. And that violence still spilled over. Thank you very much, Ernie, for a great yeah. talk. Oh, wait. I have three books for sale because Milwaukee cleaned me out last night. So I have the three copies. But thank you guys so much. We appreciate I appreciate it. So thank you. Thanks, thank you, thank yeah. you very much for coming. So great to you, everybody. Everyone have a wonderful uh, Thanksgiving and a wonderful November. Very nice to see everybody in December. Yeah, look at that 20% percent thing you say. I wonder if it's 20% of all the soldiers or 20% of the people who saw that. Yeah. Because I can't believe you were a moral person. Really you wouldn't be affected in some manner. Yeah. And to the ones that weren't, I question, well, they might they might have been the cooks you didn't see, you know, or the, you know, yeah. somebody, I want, you know, just that 20% is not, you can't, you know? It's it's hard to tell. I mean, it's so shot in the dark, but it's just, it begs the question, start asking as we